My name is Ilya Gutman, and I live here in Marshall. Let me first explain why I'm here. Several months ago, I gave a presentation at the Marshall DEI committee, and then based on the expressed interest, I was invited to do my presentation at this conference, and I really appreciate the, the invitation. I was hesitant at first, uh, as I had never done anything similar to this thing. But then I saw the theme of this year conference, and I felt that it fits perfectly with what I was wanted to say. The power of truth telling. Uh, for almost half of my life, I was deprived of that power as I could not tell it. And I was also prevented from hearing it. Telling the truth gives us ability to discuss things honestly, to find common grounds, and then come up with the solutions to the problems. It means that we should be empowered to tell the truth without fear of repercussion, even if we know others may disagree or won't like it. But it also assumes that we should not fear listening to others and disagree with, who disagree with us. Because when we listen to them, we learn, even if we, if we disagree. And it gives us power to understand others better. Obviously, there are no alternative facts. But opinions, which are based on people's knowledge, which may be limited, can be different. Uh, and we should not be afraid of being uh, wrong in ours, even though it may take efforts and inner strength. It's great to learn new facts. And it's OK to change opinions based on those new facts. We need the truth even if sometimes it's inconvenient. In fact, the truth is always inconvenient, but we need to be open-minded in order to learn from it. Learning makes us better. And since we are, we are all here today, I hope that everyone agrees with me. Uh, before we start, uh, I want you to know uh, that this is an emotional topic for me. As I said, I have never done anything similar, but uh, it's personal. But I will try to do my best to share my knowledge and experience in order to help you be aware of things you usually don't deal with much. I will try to stick to the facts uh, and will minimize expressing my opinion as much as possible. Please send me uh, questions through chat, as Julia said, and I will try to answer them, some of them if we have time left at the end. Uh, Anti-Semitism is not an easy topic. As history of Jews is full of violence against them, rejections and other hardship, so of course you would want to know where, why I even wanted to speak about this the first time to begin with. Well, I'm Jewish. Not many people in Marshall know that because while this part of my identity is very important to me, it really shouldn't matter to you or other people. So I would never go around advertising who I am or bring it up unless it is somehow relevant like now. It may sound strange, but I want to be treated as an individual, as a unique human being, not as a tiny piece of any group. An idea of this presentation came to my mind shortly after the hostage taking in Calloville Synagogue in Texas and January. Amazingly, at some point uh, during the crisis, an FBI spokesman claimed uh, that this hostage crisis was not related to the Jewish community. As if the fact that it took place in a synagogue was not enough to make it all about it and a clear element of anti-Semitic events happening all over the world. But what was even worse, this whole ordeal was forgotten by the media within a few days. There were no multiple calls by celebrities and politicians to fight anti-Semitism, no demonstrations to that effect, no long discussions about its history. Pretty much the same as usual when Jews are targeted and in total contrast with other hate-driven attacks, which are denounced by everyone and around the clock media coverage. That is when I thought I needed to do my small part. Before I get into the history of anti-Semitism, I should probably describe what life was in the Soviet Union where my family originally came from. There were exactly two Jews in my class of over 100 in, in my school uh, on its own. That wasn't a problem. Since most teachers, even though not Jewish, were good and cared about all kids. So it was totally irrelevant that they were not like me. But as almost everywhere, there were a few anti-Semites in the class. And again, as always, there were a few other kids who liked to pick on someone who is being picked on already. The way many kids behave at that age in all countries. Being called names was a frequent occurrence, but complaining to authorities was useless. A teacher once overheard the slur, but what he did, he attempted uh, to public shame the perpetrators, did nothing positive, even though he had good intentions, which is, by the way, not uncommon. Uh, an effort to help may actually backfire if done without full understanding of the situation. Since fighting at every time it happened was impossible, naturally, we just learned to ignore it, except for some extreme cases. However, we never felt as victims because that never helps. In fact, I really believe that this experience made me stronger 
and prepare to stand for myself when possible and to ignore things that I can't change. Regrettably, uh, there was no shortage of adult anti-Semites in the Soviet Union. And that made hearing slurs in line to buy shoes or meat and on public transportation not uncommon. Of course, when people are unhappy with shortages and pet buses, which is a typical feature of the socialist country, they may be more prone to throwing their worst, showing their worst. However, it was systemic government discrimination that contributed, that constituted the worst and really the only meaningful aspect of anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union. Uh, it started in the late 1940s and reached its peak with the so-called doctor's plot when Stalin accused mostly Jewish doctors of trying to kill Soviet leaders and all Jews of being Zionists and wanted to exile them all to Siberia. In fact, my grandfather barely escaped being arrested right before Stalin's death. Since then, discrimination against Jews was an unofficial policy of the Soviet government. As a result, I, like my wife and so many other Jews there, could not go to my preferred college despite having very high GPA. Education was always considered essential for Jews. In some cases, Jews were, uh, were told point blank to not even waste time uh, uh, because they would not have no chances. But sometimes it was just a common knowledge that many high demand colleges like medical or foreign relations related, for example, did not take Jews. By the way, in case you wonder, it was very simple to do in the Soviet Union because all colleges had individual entrance exams, including some oral ones. So it was easy for examiners to keep asking high and higher level questions well beyond school program of those who were not supposed to be admitted until they would finally fail. After graduating from college, both my wife and I could not apply to graduate schools and the employer that was considered the best was, uh, uh, for me was out of questions for a few Jews in my graduating class from college. Again, our GPAs were not relevant, being Jews was. And an official explanation was always simple. Jews comprise less than 1% of the population and allowing them to advance in greater numbers would be unfair to others. Of course, that deliberator did not take into account that in Leningrad, there were at least five times as many Jews, let alone consider they were well above average uh, readiness for college. Uh, in order to move forward, I need to explain one important thing here. In the Soviet Union, every person was obligated to obtain a passport at 16. And you can see some examples here on this uh, slide. Uh, and what uh, that passport was listing person's ethnicity right after the date and place of birth. However, ethnicity was called nationality in the Soviet Union and Jewishness was considered a nationality there. So further in my presentation, I may be using them interchangeably. Presenting this passport everywhere uh, for identification was required. So there was no way of hiding the fact of someone being Jewish. Nationality was an entry in practically all documents, including even classroom student rosters that teachers used, and which, by the way, were always uh, left open on teacher's desk for everyone to see. In fact, the only thing Jews in the Soviet Union ever wanted was to not have the nationality entry everywhere in order to at least have a hope for being treated equally and have opportunities based on merit. By the way, the proliferation of national, nationality entries in all documents in the Soviet Union is why I don't like ethnicity, religion, race, and other similar questions in America. To protect people from discrimination, it should not be anyone's business. And keeping statistics based on this data may lead to abuse like it did in the Soviet Union. Naturally, as always, if a certain population group is truly discriminated against, people will try to find a way not to be associated with that group. As you all know, when racism was bad in America in the past, African-Americans tried to pass for whites. So in the Soviet Union, Jews used any opportunity to list a different nationality in their passports. As a result, since the initial entry in one's passport was based on one's, uh, 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 of one of parents' nationalities, given the reality of discrimination, in all mixed families, kids were always listed uh, as not Jewish. A discriminate, uh, discriminated group, which in turn was giving opportunities to future generations as well. So for example, if someone's grandmother was not Jewish, her kids would not be listed as Jews and their kids in turn would not be either. In other words, people who only had one non-Jewish grandparent or even great grandparent had passports listing nationality of that uh, person, whatever it was, Russian, Greek, Ukrainian, to avoid discrimination. Unfortunately, 
that still didn't guarantee freedom of that from bias because people quite often were still able to distinguish Jews by their surnames or even their appearance. Of course, the opposite is also true in unequal societies. If a certain group of the population has advantages, others try to find a way to join that privileged group when they have options. So when for a short time, Jews were the only people allowed to officially emigrate from the Soviet Union, others who also wanted to leave the country, and there were a lot of them, tried to list themselves as Jews, a lucky group at that time for a brief period on their papers. For example, people tried to find the forgotten Jewish great-grandparents and change their nationality to Jewish on their paperwork. And of course, during those few years, kids whose parents wanted to live were picking nationality of their Jewish parents. This time, beneficial for those trying to leave the country when it was time to obtain a passport. Something similar is common in the present day America. When people choose one's parents' identity when making a choice for filling out applications or in self-identification, the choice they think would help them later. By the way, I would never blame those people. If, for example, being left-handed would give some advantages in this present society, naturally, people would start finding ways to declare themselves left-handed. To wrap this part up, I have to say that my family came to America more than 30 years ago with two suitcases per person. We told ourselves right away that America didn't owe us anything. It already did us a great favor by letting us in. So it was us who owed our gratitude. Of course, finding jobs was not easy and our limited English, which we knew was essential and worked hard to improve and our accent, which was obvious after the first words we uttered over the phone, no need to even see us, were definitely an obstacle. But we understood the hesitation and never blamed people for not willing to risk hiring someone who they knew nothing about. My wife's first job was in a tiny town of 500, that is after living in a 5 million city of Leningrad in the Soviet Union, with no Jews and no Russians, where no, we knew no one, and where our accent was sticking like a sore thumb. But we moved there because we felt we need to do this to move forward. Uh, by the way, speaking of accents, since our accent will always be with us, we understand when people ask where we are from and even appreciate. Considering that uh, an overwhelming majority of people who genuinely, uh, are genuinely friendly and curious and ask in good faith and out of true interest, this question gives us a perfect opportunity to share our background and find things in common. We should always be the goal if you want to create mutual trust because emphasizing differences create more prejudice and bias. People will always notice that we are different. It's a fact and there is nothing wrong with uh, noticing it. And we prefer they ask rather than pretend they don't hear it, which would be like not noticing an elephant in the room. So suppressing out of false sensitivity, a desire to ask a question is a terrible way to start a conversation. And in many cases, just a missed opportunity to build a relationship. Sometimes to humor people, we say that we are from Minnesota and are perfectly okay when people sheepishly tell us that we don't sound Minnesotan. As they teach in first grade, there are no bad questions. Speaking of our limited knowledge of English and to make this presentation uh, less depressing, as I said, the Jewish history is a story of survival. Before I move on, I want to share a story. It is from a few days after my family came to America and we were riding a bus to downtown Minneapolis for the first time, for obvious reason, we didn't have a car then. Naturally, we were speaking Russian to each other. When all of a sudden, a huge black guy standing next to us and believe it or not, he was literally the first black person we saw that close because there were virtually no black people in Leningrad. Ask us a question, what is your nationality? As I said before, the word nationality, which is by the way spelled and pronounced similarly in Russian and in English, has a little bit different meaning in Russian. Basically, without ex exception, that question asked back in the Soviet Union meant a desire to know if people were Jewish or not, in most cases with negative consequences for those who happen to be Jewish. Both my wife and I froze, and I found a smart way not to say we were Jewish, even though it would have been an appropriate response based on all our previous experience in the Soviet Union. I just said that we were speaking Russian. In response, the guy smiled broadly and cheerfully said, welcome to America. He almost hugged us. Obviously, that was all he wanted to know, what language we were speaking, and by extension, where we had come from. A totally natural question from a nice person. Had we not responded, assuming the worst, we could have been left with the impression that riding a bus was dangerous and our attempt to escape anti-Semitism was in vain. But this taught us a valuable lesson. Our own perceptions were standing on our way to feel comfortable. It was us who had to change and adjust since we came to America, not the other way around. 
We had to let our fears and securities go and stop seeing anti-Semitism and everything around us, interpreting what we may hear as such and thinking of everything in terms of anti-Semitism, even though that was the way of life back in the Soviet Union. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I will talk a little bit about history here. Um, as you may know, Jewish, Jewish, Jewish history started long ago. According to the Bible, for 400 years, Jews were slaves in Egypt, and the escape from slavery and gaining freedom is celebrated every year during the holiday of Passover. The ancient Israel is thought to be formed around 1000 year BC, when the first Jewish temple in Jerusalem was built. This temple was later destroyed by Babylonians when they took over the city and exiled all Jews about 600 BC, but it was rebuilt several centuries later when they came back. Around 50 year BC, Romans annexed Judea, as the area was called at that time. Uh, and when Jews revolted around 100 years later, Romans captured Jerusalem, slaughtered its defenders, and destroyed the second Jewish temple. Its only remaining part is called the Wailing Wall. It is now the most sacred place in the world for all Jews. After crushing the second Jewish rebellion in the second century, Romans renamed the area Palestine to erase memory of Jewish presence and forbade Jews from even living in Jerusalem, thus making them refugees for almost two millennia with no country of their own. The Middle Ages uh, brought only more misery. In short, Jews as a group, rather than individuals, were baselessly and repeatedly accused of terrible crimes, including such things as ritual murders of Christian children and undermining the garments and religion with awful consequences. In much of Europe, for much of the Middle Ages, Jews were denied citizenship, prevented from holding government posts, excluded from membership in professional organizations, forced to wear yellow identif identification badges, and so on. They were limited in where they could live. The term ghetto was coined first in Venice, Italy, as the only place where Jews were permitted to reside. And they also could not, uh, uh, they were also limited in what they could do for living. This was not the worst though. Jews were repeatedly killed, including in mid 14th century during the Black Death, a bubonic plague pandemic in Europe, when they were accused of intentionally spreading it by poisoning water wells. They didn't know much about viruses and bacteria at that time. Uh, so they were accused of uh, intentional sp spreading it by poisoning water wells. Hundreds of communities were destroyed with children and women killed among others. When not killed, Jews were expelled, including from England in the 13th century, France in Germany in the 14th century, and Portugal and Spain in the 15th century. In many cases, with just, uh, they were expelled with just clothes they were wearing. Many church leaders, both Catholic and Lutheran, were anti-Semitic, so no wonder crusaders were killing Jews when they were on their way. An inquisition was forcing Jews to convert to Christianity, and for a very long time, an accusation of a false conversion was a death sentence. If, in fact, Jews were not officially considered full citizens in most of Europe until mid 19th century, which unfortunately did not eliminate unequal treatment and anti-Semitism. Other areas of the world uh, were not uh, much more hospitable to Jews. In Eastern Europe, which was dominated by Russia, Jews were also significantly limited in where they could live, with many main cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg being off limits for them, with very few exceptions. It doesn't mean that they were left alone in areas where they were permitted to reside. The word pogrom, defined as an organized massacre of a specific minority, Jews, has Russian origin. Hundreds of them uh, took place in the, uh, up to the early 20th century, often with a blessing and even encouragement from local governments. Tens of thousands of Jews were killed, babies were thrown out of the windows, pregnant women were raped, and their bellies were ripped open. All of this accompanied by mass looting. In the Middle East, the situation wasn't any better. On multiple occasions, Jews were massacred, their wealth was taken, their synagogues were destroyed, and they were expelled from many places including as recently as the middle of the 20th century, when almost a million Jews were displaced. And even in America, uh, Jews were not uh, spared. For example, during the Civil War, both sides in the conflict, unsurprisingly because it's very common, blamed Jews for supporting the enemy. And General Grant even ordered all Jews expelled from the area that was under his control. Fortunately, President Lincoln canceled this order and Grant himself felt guilty afterwards. 
But even later, in the beginning of the 20th century, several Jews were lynched. This widespread anti-Semitism culminated last century in the Holocaust, when about 6 million Jews were murdered in Europe within several years. In all, it all started with these discriminatory Nuremberg laws in 1935 that were first defined Jews by the amount of Jewish blood and then stripped all of them of legal rights, including citizenship. It forbade marriages between them and Germans and barred Jews from certain professions. Jewish businesses were boycotted and even attacked and destroyed, which culminated in 1938 during Crystal Night or Crystal Night, so called because so many Jewish uh, uh, owned businesses had their glass storefronts broken and stores looted. But that wasn't enough. Uh, and the Nazis uh, created a plan. They called the final solution to exterminate all Jews. In the process, Jews were subject to medical experiments and burnt in gas chambers in the concentration camps. They were shot, shot in large groups in uh, other places to be buried in large pits, some of them alive. People's fingers were cut off to take their uh, wedding rings and their teeth were broken out as some may have golden crowns. It's also important to know that even though the Holocaust was initiated and carried out by the Nazis, there were local collaborators in almost all countries occupied by Germany. So Jews had nowhere to hide and were easily hunted down. There were of course some brave people who helped, but not many, since most people, even if not anti-Semitic themselves, did not want to risk their own lives. Unfortunately, the rest of the world knew about it, but mostly looked the other way, including America, where even the New York Times downplayed the horrors of the Holocaust. Many countries refused to admit Jewish refugees, who obviously were not looking for better lives, but rather trying to escape persecution and death. In 1939, America notoriously turned away a ship full of German Jews. Most of them later ended up in German concentration camps, and many were killed there. Few know the names of, uh, uh, names of people on board, even the, uh, even the name of the ship, it was St. Louis, as you can see. But what is more shocking is that in 2021, Paul found that many other, uh, among many other uh, findings, very appalling, that many young Americans, nearly a quarter of those under 40, believe the Holocaust either never happened or has been accelerated. In 2020, Paul, nearly 10% said that they had never heard of the Holocaust and two thirds were unaware that 6 million Jews were killed. Well, no wonder though, as the Holocaust is barely taught in American schools and was not even included in the first draft of the Minnesota Social Studies Standards intended for school curriculum development. Uh, as for Germany, it eventually paid compensation to the Holocaust victims but rightfully only to people who suffered personally during the Holocaust and not their descendants, which makes little sense because otherwise almost the entire world, world would owe damages to Jews for 2000 years of terrible suffering. But money cannot fix everything. So many Jews perished during the Holocaust that the world Jewish population still didn't get to the prayer war level. Uh, it may seem strange that Jews were subject to such hatred and then antisemitism was so common. Considering that Jews were usually living in close-knit communities with limited interactions with others and were mostly restricted to the, in their ability to affect lives of people around. However, they have always been a very convenient scapegoat in practically all situations and for all occasions. Living together in large groups, mostly defenseless and clearly different looking due to, uh, looking, uh, uh, due to clothing they wore and identification signs they were forced to wear. And when in some cases that was not enough, there was always another way. Jewish men were the only circumcised ones in Europe at that time. So it was almost impossible for them to hide their identities. Of course, religious animosity also played a big role. Throughout histories, and I, try, I was trying to list it here, uh, Jews were accused of controlling the world and being inferior. Desire to assimilate too much, a desire to stay apart from local population. Spoiling local cultures by taking them over, or participating too much in ignoring long custom. Being communists and revolutionaries and being imperialists and exploiters of the poor. Being nationalists and being internationalists. Being warmongers and being pacifists. The list is endless. And as you can see, accusation in so many cases are illogical and mutually exclusive, but that never deterred the accusers. And it can be explained. In addition to everything else, 
Jews were frequently feared for their supposed desire to rule the world and control others. Since fear is one of the strongest human emotions, which reduces ability to think reasonably, it was the driving force for attacks and hatred. And this fear is what makes anti-Semitism different from other bigotry and prejudice. It has become something akin to a huge, all-encompassing conspiracy theory in which Jews individually or as group are blamed for practically anything and everything, depending on the moment. As a result, Jews, nearly always a tiny minority everywhere, have been the only ones in the world who experienced persecution, uh, persecution and discrimination for so long. Uh, Anti-Semitism has existed everywhere in the, on the planet, from Sweden to South Africa, from China to Canada, and even in Israel. Here, it may be also necessary to mention, in light of recent discussion in the media and on TV, that whether Jews are a race or not is totally irrelevant. Jews were always the target as Jews, whether those killing and maiming them consider them a race, ethnicity, nationality, religion, or define them by the amount of Jewish blood. Only Jews were targeted to the point of desire to exterminate them completely just for their existence, regardless of where they were and what they were doing. And in most cases, attackers were not concerned with the definitions. Uh, I will make a short brief pause here. I, I hope I'm not doing it too quickly. So uh, if you have any questions uh, in what uh, uh, I just talked about, about the history and my personal history, I can try to answer them or we can uh, delay it to the very end of the presentation. Okay, I will move on then. Uh, we can turn to more, rec more recent events now. Uh, but first I want to discuss some terminology uh, because uh, even if we are talking about antisemitism, it's important to mention so-called anti-Zionism. Uh, we can start with the definition. Zionism is a political movement for the establishment and support of a national homeland for Jews in Israel and support for Jews who want to live there. If we rephrase it, it is a support for the Jewish state of Israel and Jewish people living or wanting to live there. Nothing unusual or controversial here, since practically all countries are based on a similar idea. French have their country and so do Finns. Chinese have their own country and so do Vietnamese. Zionism was born in the 19th century in Europe as a reaction to everyday anti-Semitism and discrimination. Of course, you also remember that about 2000 years ago, Jerusalem and surrounding areas were captured by the Roman Empire, which in what we now would now call imperialistic expansion to the East, brutally suppressed Jewish uprising, renamed the region and expelled all Jews who were fighting for their freedom and independence. In reality, one may say that Jews are an indigenous population in Israel, who were driven uh, out by the conquerors, and Romans essentially became settlers, and many others who came after them. So it is only natural that Jews wanted to have their own country where they used to live long ago and where they would feel safe. But not to some, as Israel is the only country in the world that is still not recognized by almost 20% of the fellow UN member states, and some countries do not even let Israelis citizens in. Consequently, being an anti-Zionist means denying Jews what all other people in the world have, their own country, which is clearly anti-Semitic, which was uh, recognized even by Martin Luther King when he said that anti-Zionist is inherently anti-Semitic. Speaking of Israel, I want to say, just in case, that critiquing it is not necessarily anti-Semitic, since Israel, as any other state, makes mistakes, it does the wrong things. However, it is anti-Semitic to criticize Israel for things that other countries are routinely and easily forgiven, if even ever called out for. It is not by chance that almost 50% of re resolutions by the UN Human Rights Commission are devoted to condemning Israel, meaning that Israel is denounced by the UN almost as much as all other countries combined. And those countries include North Korea, Cuba, Iran, and the former Soviet Union. The same people who say that tying COVID to China leads to anti-Asian feelings are oblivious, intentional or not, to the obvious fact that demonizing Israel has always led to increased anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, attacking Israel for minor transgressions gives some people a feeling that attacking Jews is also okay. Sadly, anti-Semitism in the world is still widespread and pervasive. And as in the past, that uh, animosity inevitably turns into violence. Israel's Olympic team was attacked and 11 members were killed in Munich, Germany in 1972. 
100 suffered in a scenario bombing in Belgium in 1981. Almost 400 people were killed and injured in the bombing of the Jewish community center in Argentina in 1994. And the largest anti-Jewish riot in the history of Norway took place in Oslo at the end of 2009, among many other attacks. Uh, Jews have been targeted in Europe to the point that synagogues need to have guards and Jews are advised not to wear traditional Jewish clothing. Even the leader of the Labour Party in Great Britain was accused of antisemitism and suspended. In fact, antisemitism in 2021 was the worst in decades. What's more, COVID pandemic brought new conspiracy theories that accused Jews of the panic on the moment, creating COVID, actually 20% of Brits believe this, according to one survey, and for forcing people to vaccinate and wear masks. Just like many people still believe that Jews were responsible for 9-11. And no wonder, since according to one poll, a quarter of the Earth population holds somewhat anti-Semitic stereotypes, and several countries in Europe have that number higher than 50%. There may be little doubt that there are more anti-Semites in the world than there are racists, if we consider that practically every true racist is also an anti-Semite. All white supremacists are equally racist and anti-Semitic, and in fact, it is really hard to find any hateful bigot who doesn't hate Jews as well. As an example, the mass murderer in Buffalo, New York, who killed 10 African-Americans in May, was actually blaming Jews for everything, according to the notes he left. On the other hand, some countries have anti-Semitic governments, such as Iran, uh, where slogans like death to Israel and denial of the Holocaust are almost an official government policy. And black Jews at some point had to be rescued by Israel from Ethiopia. And surprisingly, many otherwise progressive people treat Jews differently, even though Jews are persons of color, like all other people of the Middle Eastern origin. So what about America? Uh, I have already mentioned the case uh, uh, with the ship full of Jewish refugees. But even after the World War II, the State Department adamantly opposed recognizing Israel. And President Truman reportedly, reportedly did not allow Jews in his home. Antisemitism in America was bad until relatively recently, and in fact, one of the reasons for FDR's unwillingness to help Jews during the Holocaust was widespread anti-Semitism in the country. Jews were not permitted to live in certain areas. For example, Minneapolis suburb of St. Louis Park was the place where many Jews lived in 1990 when we came, because other suburbs restricted Jewish home ownership until 1960. Jews were not permitted to live in, uh, uh, to uh, uh, join many organizations. And in many cases, people were unwilling to hire them. Some hotels and pools did not serve Jews, and even some beaches were off limit to them, along with African-Americans, which was not uncommon as many restrictions were imposed on both African-Americans and Jews. Uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, Harvard and other Ivy League schools limited the number of Jews they were willing to admit. According to the New York Magazine, and I will quote here, A. Lawrence Lowell, Harvard's president in the 1920s stated flatly that too many Jews would destroy the school. Lowell and his counterparts at Yale and Princeton realized that if a definition of merit based on academic success was leading to the wrong kind of student, the solution was to change the definition of merit. And so the admission office at Harvard became much more interested in the details of an applicant's personal life. Lowell told his admission officers to elicit information about the character of candidates from persons who know the applicants well. And so the letter of reference became mandatory. Harvard started asking applicants to provide a photograph. Candidates had to write personal essays demonstrating their aptitude for leadership and list their extracurricular activities. As you can see, all those subjective measures and questions that are considered normal now were implemented with the only goal, preventing Jews from becoming Harvard or Yale students based on objective criteria. Not much, not much different, I can say, uh, than how it was in the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 1980s, because subjective criteria are easy to be manipulated to achieve a desired goal of certain representation. Remember I said that calculating percentages may lead to discrimination? It does. And it wasn't just the, the college admin, uh, administration that were anti-Semitic. The campus of atmosphere were hostile to Jews. According to the same New Yorker piece, the first black captain of the Yale football team was a man named Levi Jackson, who graduated in 1950 and went on to become a top, ex top executive at Ford. Jackson was a hugely popular figure on campus. When he was stepped for the executive secret society's skulls and bones, he joked, 
If my name had been reversed, I never do, would have made it. Alluding to the fact that Levi was a very common Jewish last name and the guy named Jackson Levi would be at the big disadvantage. They would never make, have made it. Minneapolis was one of the worst places. The following is a quote from the NPR. In 1930s and 1940s, Minneapolis had the dubious distinction of being one of the most anti-Semitic cities in America. In fact, after visiting the city in 1946, prominent journalist and lecturer, Kerry McWilliams wrote that one may even say with a measure of justification that Minneapolis is the capital of anti-Semitism in the United States. McWilliams pointed to an iron curtain separating the Jewish population from everyone else, including finding jobs, buying houses, even shopping at certain stores. It's a separation that seemed to have been there since the city's beginning. But anti-Semitism was not limited to non-physical variety. In 1940s, Jewish communities in Boston and New York were terrorized, while authorities looked the other way. In what the New York Post called an almost daily occurrence, Jews in some areas were attacked and beaten on the streets and in parks, with some victims stabbed and disfigured, and some girls having had their clothes ripped off. Things didn't get much better after the World War II despite all the horrors of the Holocaust. Stanford University has just issued an apology for its, po its policies in the 1950s restricting Jewish admissions, the same as it was in Harvard before. It was a common practice in other universities. Even medical schools didn't want to admit Jews and some hospitals didn't want to hire them. So uh, sometimes Jew had, Jews had to create their own hospitals. Furthermore, synagogues were bombed and burned in the South in the 1960s and 1950s, along with black churches. So no wonder that Jews were standing together with African-Americans in their fight for the civil rights. It was Rabbi Abraham Herschel marching next to Martin Luther King in Selma, Alabama, and they did win. Now, to close this topic of, anti of historic anti-Semitism in America, I want to mention uh, that the main terminal in the uh, Minneapolis St. Paul Airport is named after Charles Lindbergh, an anti-Semite and possibly a Nazi sympathizer. And that uh, uh, there is his monument next to the Minneapolis, Minnesota state capital. However, I'm not aware of any Jews who have troubles flying from Minneapolis or want to rename the airport and take down Lindbergh statue. By the way, taking down monuments was national pastime in the Soviet Union because history was always rewritten there to praise past villains and condemn past heroes. I know that he is honored for other things that were worth the honor and any resentment would be misguided and would speak poorly of Jews. No one should shun Wagner's music or skip Dostoevsky or T.S. Eliot books just because they were anti-Semites or burn other writers' books just because they use slurs in conjunction, uh, conjunction with Jewish characters. And of course, we should not be avoiding driving cars named after Henry Ford, who, among other things, published anti-Semitic newspapers and books and was even praised by Hitler for his views. People are complex. Even though anti-Semitics, they may deserve the honor for what good they did in their lives. How is America doing now? Well, uh, you will be surprised to learn that, according to the Newsweek magazine, Jews are per capita the victims of more hate crimes than any other group in the United States, and by a large margin. Yeah, that's right. Jews are, are attacked more than others, much more. The numbers are telling. Jews are almost three times more likely to be attacked than the next minority group. 55% of faith-based hate crimes are anti-Jewish, despite Jews constituting only 2% of the population. Not only anti-Jewish crimes are on the top of the FBI hate crime list, but they're also everywhere. You can see that every single state uh, uh, had uh, anti-Semitic crimes, hate crimes, uh, and they keep rising. Again, a few numbers here. In New York City, this February, uh, they were up almost 300% compared to the same month last year. And in 2021, the number of anti-Semitic accidents was the highest since statistics began in 1979. In fact, according to CNN, in the first half of this year, anti-Jewish crimes constitute almost two thirds of all hate crime in New York, despite Jews comprising only 13% of the population there. Worse, the perpetrators, even if cut, are not prosecuted. Since 2018, only one person was convicted. As a result, uh, uh, in 2021 survey, 50% of Jews say that they will feel less safety lately, and 40% change their behavior to avoid anti-Semitism. 
Sadly, there is no safety anywhere. Saint Jews, reflecting reality they are familiar with, expect danger from both right and left side of the political spectrum and from all races and ethnic group, because the strongest uh, anti-Semitic tendencies lately come from unexpected corners, not from where they used to come. So next time, when you hear or read about hate crime, just think about a Jewish man uh, being attacked in New York City. Of course, America is no exception. Uh, uh, Canada, and this is a Canadian statistic, has exactly the same problem. Why don't people know about the statistics? Because the media does not talk about this. In fact, it underreports antisemitism by a huge margin, according to the same magazine. Why is it? I have some ideas, but as I said, I will stick to the facts only, so you can try to come up with your own explanation for this unpleasant trend. An example of this reporting bias is the latest mass shooting in Highland Park, Illinois, on July 4th. Unless you do some additional research, you would never know that almost half of that area population is Jewish, that many victims were Jewish, and the shooter posted anti-Semitic commentary and not long before the, his evil act, which taken together practically guarantees that anti-Semitism was the driving force there. Similarly, a, a recent attacks on Jewish businesses and places of worship in Los Angeles and anti-Semitism uh, and anti-Semitic comments from the discredited Los Angeles City Council president were barely reported. Consequently, more than 50% of Americans either didn't hear much or didn't hear at all about anti-Semitic attacks, let alone realize how much of them take place. A third don't even know what anti-Semitism is. Unsurprisingly, among young people, numbers are worse. Few of them know of the attacks or think of anti-Semitism as a problem. It almost seems like while in the past, Jews were targeted because they were so much different from anyone else, lately bias and attacks again against them uh, are ignored because they are considered mainstream, which of course doesn't protect them. Regrettably, uh, the young people's behavior may be a result of college life. The level of anti-Semitism taking place on college campuses is also very alarming. But it's also barely reported in major newspapers or TV programs. Young people who don't know about the Holocaust or more broadly about history and believe that they are destined to bring justice use the color of anti-Zionism in protecting, protesting Israel to harass Jewish students. For example, Jewish students were disqualified from a student leadership positions or from participating in campus activism and political groups for expressing and even assumed support for Israel. Professors refused to support students going to Israel for study abroad, threatened to reduce grades to, for supporting Zionists, claimed that Jews are responsible for 9-11, and made disparaging remarks about Holocaust and Jews in general, let alone classic cases of anti-Semitism in forms of swastika graffiti and throwing eggs during Jewish gathering. In fact, the University of Vermont is currently under federal investigation for anti-Semitism, and there were more than 350 documented episodes of anti-Semitism on college campuses last year. No wonder that half of Jewish college students hide their identity, and of those who do not, 65% feel unsafe. But it starts in school. I already mentioned Minnesota social studies standards, but proposed eth uh, uh, ethnic studies curriculum in uh, California was even worse. It was deemed explicitly anti-Jewish. Young people are also strongly influenced by what they hear from celebrities, politicians, and other role models on TV and internet. In many of them treat Jews differently and express anti-Semitic views. We have plenty of recent examples, including the case when Jews were not permitted to march in a recent Chicago Pride Parade. Sadly, expressions of anti-Semitism are also dealt a little bit differently. While uh, Kanye West and Major Taylor Green were roundly and rightfully denounced, similar ideas coming from Louis Farrakhan's Nation of Islam received just muted criticism, despite the list uh, the, uh, being considered hate group with uh, Southern Poverty, uh, Poverty Law Center. As you just saw, Jews have suffered from anti-Semitism for millennia and were murdered, exiled, and discriminated against practically everywhere on earth. This historic injustice is visible even in some odd facts. For example, no one is naming sports team after them. There is no fighting Jews football team after all. And those names usually show respect for the subject and in some uh, cases even admiration. In fact, I can say that if a slur for Jews, which was hated in the Soviet Union, we used, for example, in a basketball team name there, many Jews there would be happy, as it would be a sign that was no longer a slur. On the other hand, as always, some things that are called anti-Semitic are really not. 
A good example maybe of what happened here in Marshall about two years ago. A couple went to a local Walmart wearing masks with swastikas on them. When confronted, they said that they were protesting mask mandate, which in their minds would lead to socialism like in German, Nazi Germany. The problem, of course, is that socialism was in the Soviet Union, not Germany, and its symbol was hammer and sickle, not swastika. So the problem was not anti-Semitism, but inadequate education. In one thing they were right though, socialism is no better than fascism and actually killed more people in the world. Similarly, criticizing even strongly a specific person who happened to be Jewish, be it George Soros or Jared Kushner, does not mean on its own anti-Semitism. Just like, as I mentioned before, criticizing Israel may be perfectly legitimate. And finally, we all know that politics is dirty and demonizing opponents is a fair game in it. That is, until that de uh, demonization starts bleeding into entire group or is done repeatedly, which is why in most cases, we should be willing to give people the benefit of the doubt. In fact, certain things like mindless comparing things to the Holocaust, calling opponents Nazis, or liking people to Hitler may often be attributed to plain lack of history and knowledge. Not many things may truly be called fascism and nothing can be compared to the Holocaust. And those comparisons trivialize and minimize the horrors of the real things. Uh, as we are coming to the conclusion of this presentation, I want to emphasize here, they're not suggesting people becoming anti-anti-Semites and start policing Twitter for signs of anti-Semitism or call other people for that. This is counterproductive and will inevitably lead to false cases because when people try hard to find something everywhere, they will find it even an innocent thing somewhere, let alone the subconscious bias may only be removed naturally and gradually as uh, forcing it removal will lead either to resentment or another opposite conscious bias. No one has to emphasize that Albert Einstein, Charlie Chaplin and Bob Dylan were Jewish, even though it would be nice to see Chaplin and George Gershwin mentioned in high school history book because they were not even in my son AP US history textbook, but I don't want them to be mentioned as Jews. I just want them to be mentioned uh, as people who made significant contribution to American culture. No one insists on making books by Nobel Prize winners Isaac Bashevich Zinger and Saul Bellow mandatory reading in school or suggest that only Jewish actors play Jews in movies. Christmas is a great holiday and I happily say Merry Christmas just as I say Happy Birthday. And I absolutely do not want anyone to feel guilty for the past, even though quite a few people participated in persecuting Jews or belonging to organizations that did because it was so widespread for so long, as you just learned. But it would be extremely unfair to hold, for example, all Christians responsible for what Inquisition and Crusaders did centuries ago. So what do I want? Let me first ask you a question. When is the Jewish American Heritage Month? Well, it's May. Uh, I think, uh, uh, I may safely guess that few people know that. And I didn't either until very recently when I was actually doing research for this presentation. In fact, I was sure it did not exist based on my watching a, a conversation between a wonderful actor, Morgan Freeman and Mike Wallace of 60 Minutes in 2005. Freeman asked Wallace if there was a Jewish history month and if he wanted to have one. Wallace responded that there was no such thing and he would not want to have one either to which Freeman concurred and then said that Black History Month is ridiculous and should not exist because Black history is American history. Nevertheless, in 2006, President Bush designated May as a Jewish American Heritage Month. But as you could have noticed, Jewish history is typically not mentioned anywhere during that time. And it's fine with me because like Wallace and Freeman, I don't want to have it as it would be, it would be a special treatment which I don't want or need. So my only goal today is to make you aware that anti-Semitism is still a problem and encourage you to think critically of everything you read or see, and then compare and view things in perspective to this awareness. I want to add on a positive note. I have been living in America for over 30 years, all but one year in small town, and not a single time I felt anti-Semitism personal. In fact, I have not seen any discrimination in the way I, a person who had dealt with it a lot in the Soviet Union, define it. As I said before, I had not uh, considered uh, uh, multiple rejections to even grant me an interview that I encountered shortly before, uh, after we came to America as discrimination. Uh, those rejections were based on legitimate concern of employers who wanted to hire the best. And one cannot be the best if they have troubles understanding simple driving directions over the phone. I don't blame those people, but it gives me an opportunity to be even more great, uh, grateful to those who took the risk and hired me later 
and let, try to help me with everything they could. How are we doing with time? Uh, let me see. We're right about um, five minutes over, but that's okay uh, because we have some time and this is the last session of the day. So if you'd still like to chat a little bit um, or there's questions, um, I know there was a question that came in the chat here um, asking if you would share the difference between Jewish religion and Jewish culture. Uh, well, uh, since I'm from the Soviet Union, um, for me, Jewish religion, when I was uh, growing, was not uh, a very significant part of my life. Because uh, there was one synagogue in Leningrad for 5 million people. And going there was uh, really dangerous uh, because it, if, uh, it was uh, rumored, which is probably true, that uh, uh, KGB was watching it. And it would have been uh, dangerous for people who worked uh, uh, at, at work. So for me, Jewish culture is just feeling Jewish and talking about that and uh, uh, having the knowledge of that thing. Uh, we started going to synagogue just when we came uh, to America. Uh, the other aspect of Jewish culture for me is food, uh, because uh, even with that thing, uh, being in the Soviet Union, our grandparents were always uh, cooking something Jewish. Uh, and the holidays, again, they were not really celebrated in, in the Soviet Union, but uh, when we came to America, uh, we were glad that we could join holidays in synagogues and with our friends. Thank you so much. Uh, Are there other questions from folks or did you have other content that you'd wanted to share with us? Let me, if there are no questions, let me give you a few more thoughts at the end. Uh, the truth is, we all have biases, every single one of us, here and everywhere else. But the good thing is, there are really not too many real, irredeemable, deeply convinced anti Semites, or racists for that matter, in America. Because if you remember, even the so called Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017 was intended, attended by just about 200 people. And despite all we hear in the media, hate crimes happen at such a low rate in America that they would be considered a rare disease if it were uh, uh, applicable here. Well, in fact, hate crimes are a disease of the society, not of the persons, of course. Uh, there are about as many hate crimes in America every year as the cases of tuberculosis. Most people who have uh, uh, some anti-Semitic racist or otherwise bigoted ideas are just ignorant and insecure. And many of them, uh, 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 say something which seems wrong to us, they're just sincerely unaware of it. And don't forget that sometimes that's wrong, maybe only in our minds and perceptions, just like it was for us when we were riding downtown. Moreover, in this time of seemingly unlimited availability of data, we all suffer from lack of truthful information because, as I pointed earlier, the media has a tendency of hiding certain truth. And I'm not even talking about the internet. So in order to make progress, we need to include almost all people in open conversation and answer their questions and comments, even if an initial reaction is that they're inappropriate, because we need the truth, and that may only come from diversity of thoughts. During those conversations, we should emphasize the similarities, the common ground, and not get upset when something goes wrong. Uh, we should try to assume the best in people, not the worst, open up, share our background and thoughts, and listen to others, even if we disagree, in fact, especially if we disagree, because then we may be able to explain something better and also learn something. And when we learn something together, when we come to some uh, truth, or at least a small piece of that thing. So uh, there are some bad people, racists, anti Semites, but we should never let them spoil our lives and influence our judgment. We should never let the terrible past guide our future. We just need to remember, that, uh, remember it, you know, not to repeat it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ilya. We really appreciate it. There's a classroom full of people clapping, so that's good. Um, thank you for sharing um, so many pieces of advice, so much of your story, so much history. Um, we're really grateful for you um, spending this emotional labor to share this time with us here today. Um, and we're very grateful for you.
For the um, participants of the Overcoming Racism Conference, um, we will have one short um, uh, closing session. You can go back to the main room link for that. Um, Joyce will see us out for the day and kind of charge us moving forward on how to move forward and not just leave this here at the conference, but actually go forward and live out these pieces of advice with the new information that we have. So I'll see everybody over in the main room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.